1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, and I'm reading down to verse 8 of this uh, chapter 1 John and chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can follow me. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Ending there at verse 8, and may God bless this reading to our hearts for his name's sake. Now, I'm going to speak to you tonight on uh, what I'm calling the prospects of a saved soul. On Tuesday night, I spoke about the struggles of a, of a distressed soul, and I spoke about uh, Job. And then on Wednesday night, I spoke about the confidence of a assured soul. Uh, I was dealing with Job. Proverbs 23 and verse 10, where Job says, He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. In spite of all he was going through, Job seemed to come to realize that things would be all right at the end after the trial was over. And then last night I spoke on the strategy of an opposed soul, and we were thinking of Nehemiah and how he, uh, the strategy he used when uh, Sanballat and Tobiah and others came to frustrate and discourage and oppose the work of building the walls of Jerusalem. And tonight I want to speak on the prospects of a saved soul. I remember some years ago, I was preaching at a convention or a conference really in Blackpool in England. It was a residential weekend conference held in a hotel. And on the Sunday morning, we had no service and we were free to go to whatever church we wanted to go to. I remember walking from where the hotel was into the center of Blackpool to the Blackpool Baptist Tabernacle, I think, is called. It's a fairly prominent building at the center of Blackpool. And that Sunday morning, I heard the pastor preach from this text that I'm going to speak from tonight, uh, John, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. I was so blessed by the ministry of that man that Sunday morning in this text that I went back again in the evening before the service that I was to preach at in the hotel. And I was really blessed through his ministry. And I never... Uh, preached in that text. I never felt I could. I thought it was too precious a text to attempt preaching on. But then one day I decided to preach through 1 John uh, when I was in the pastorate and I had to tackle this verse. Martin Lloyd-Jones says about this verse, he says, I suppose we must agree that nothing more sublime than this has ever been written. And any man who has to preach upon such a text or upon such a word must be unusually conscious of his own smallness and inadequacy and unworthiness. One's tendency is to stand in wonder and amazement at it. Now, if Dr. Martin jo Lloyd-Jones could say that, one of the finest preachers that we've ever known, well, who am I to tackle this verse? But I'm going to have a, a go at it tonight. Someone has said even an angel couldn't speak on this text uh, on, and give it the treatment that it needs to be given but it's a very powerful text of Scripture. And can I just say for maybe some of you who are using modern versions, I prepared this on the authorized verse, version text, and it might sound a little different from what you find maybe in a modern version. But the first thing I want you to notice in this text is the affection that John shows. The Apostle John is the author of this uh, book, or this uh, chapter two, or three rather, and we see the affection he shows. He starts off by saying, beloved. He's writing to a group of Christians, and John obviously loved them. He held them in high regard. 
and he's showing great affection in how he addresses them, beloved. Some scholars will tell us it should mean beloved of God, that they were God's people, and he was saying to them, beloved of God. But here's a man, and he's in his 90s. He's not young anymore. He's in his 90s. He's the last surviving apostle. And here he is in that old age, and he has a great affection for the people of God. He hasn't lost his affection. Sometimes when we get older, we're accused of not being as nice as we used to be. We get old and cantankerous, but John is not that way. John loves these people, and he's showing very deep affection to them. And I think that's a characteristic that we need to see amongst the people of God today when we're living in such stressful times. We need to see uh, that affection for one another. And John says, beloved or beloved of God. I mentioned that John was an old man. Victor Hugo was a French novelist. And he wrote this in one occasion, and I want you to listen to it very carefully because it's a quite a good statement. He says, when grace is joined with wrinkles, it's adorable. Do you get it? When grace is joined with wrinkles, it's adorable. And what John is saying, when you get old and wrinkled, it's good to keep grace in your soul. And when grace is joined with wrinkles, it's adorable. And that's the first thing that we notice in this verse of Scripture, the affection that John shows for the people to whom he's writing. And he's an aged man. He very easily uh, become cantankerous and carnaptious or whatever word you might want to describe it. But no, John is showing deep affection for the people to whom he's sending this wonderful letter. And then the second thing I notice in this text is the confirmation that John makes. He says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God or the children of God? John has mentioned this in verse 1, but here he's confirming it, that right now, he says, you are the children of God. Right this very moment, you are the children of God. John is stating this positively. He's stating it clearly, and he's affirming that right at this moment, they are the children of God. And men and women, I've got to say to you tonight, right at this moment that we're saved, we are the children of God. And what a privilege and what a dignity that brings to the Christian testimony. We are right here and now God's children. It's unbelievably wonderful to think that we, poor wretches of the dust, saved by grace and grace alone, are classified as children of God. We are born into the family of God. Another old commentator puts it like this, our present state, he affirms to be unquestionably that of sons. And there is no question about it, dear soul. And if you're a born-again believer tonight, listen to this. You are right this moment a child of God. You're a son of God. Now, maybe you say, sure, we know that. But sometimes it's easy to forget it. You're now a children of God, a child of God. Some of you know our daughter Ruth, and she spent about eight years, I think, uh, in Bangladesh working in a mission hospital there. And when she went to Bangladesh at the first, there were no mobile phones, and we had no way of contacting her. And sometimes we wouldn't hear from her hardly at all. But you know that didn't mean that she wasn't our daughter any longer. She may have been living in another country, and we may not have seen very much to, of her, but she was still our daughter. She was still our child. And you know, while we're living on earth and we're away from that heavenly country that God has prepared for us, we are still the children of God. Right this moment, even though we're not home in the glory, even though we're not with the Lord, we're still the children of God. One night, a Jehovah's Witness lady called at our door, and she was yeah. selling magazines. She was trying to sell me a copy of the War Cry, and uh, not a War Cry, the Awake, and this War Cry is a Salvation Army one, uh, Awake, and uh, another magazine I can't remember. But I, I got into conversation with her, and I told her how sure I was that I was a child of God, how sure I was that I was on my way to heaven and home. And that dear lady had to say this to me. Oh, she says, sir, I don't have that assurance. I'm hoping that I'll be one of the 144,000 that will get into heaven. And there she was peddling her religious wares. And she didn't 
have that assurance. But here is John saying to these people, night now, you are the sons and daughters of God. You're the children of God. And what a blessing to be the children of God. The John Montgomery Burst, Boyce was a, an American Presbyterian preacher, went home to be with the Lord a little while ago, and he wrote this. It is not just that we have received the designation children of God, though that is true. We actually are the children of God by way of the new birth. And that's a wonderful truth, friend. It's a great assurance. John writes in his gospel in chapter 1 and verse 12, as many as receive him, him. to them give he the power to become the sons of God. So John is confirming here that right now we are the children of God. We're not waiting to the glory to find out if we are the children of God. We're not hoping we're not anticipating that maybe one day we we'll discover that we are the children of God. Right now, we are the children of God. Again, if I could quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones, and this is an amazing statement that he makes, and again, it's worth listening to. He says, we shall never be more the children of God then than we are now. In glory, I shall be a much better man, but I shall be no more a child of God. I thought that was wonderful. In glory, I will be a much better man, says Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, but I shall be no more a child of God. Oh, what assurance that is. What a blessing it is, especially in these trying times that we're living through, just to know that we are the children of God. I have a, an old hymn book here in my study written by a man called Gadsby, William Gadsby. Uh, he's known as a man, Gadsby's hymns, they call it. He was a 19th century hymn writer. And one of the hymns reads like this. In every trying deep distress, in poverty and wretchedness, this truth sweet comfort can afford. Even now are we the sons of God. Dear Father, bless us with this grace. While traveling through the wilderness, our sonship still to keep in view and honor you in all we do. Great hymn. You know, I was left without a father when I was three years old. My father was killed. And as I was a boy growing up, I used to wish I had a father. And I used to wish I had a wealthy father. I never had a father. At least I never knew him anyway. And I never knew what wealth was. But you know, there's one thing I have. I've got a heavenly father tonight. I've got a loving heavenly father. And he knows and he cares. And I'm his child. And dear folks, if we are saved by God's grace, John is exactly right. Right now, we are the children of God, the sons of God. What a blessing and what a, a, a reminder of the greatness of our relationship with him. But not only do we see in this text the affection that John shows and the confirmation that John makes, but the third thing I see is the manifestation that John anticipates. Look at verse 2 again. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Now here is John clearly stating that what we are going to be one day has yet not been revealed. It's not been revealed. It's not been manifested. John's anticipating something wonderful after this life is over. But so far it hasn't been manifested. It does not yet appear what we shall be. John is stating this very clearly that we're going to be something different, but it's not been revealed yet what it's going to be. Uh, I remember years ago, and some of you will probably remember it too, there was a, an insurance company called Ally Dunbar, and they used to advertise on, t on television. They were trying to take, get you to take out pensions and things for the future and make sure that your future was secured. And one of their slogans in that television uh, ad was this, Allied Dunbar for the life you don't yet know. Allied Dunbar for the life you don't, let, don't yet know. And folks, there's a life we don't yet know. We might get some glimpses of it in Scripture. Here and there, there's little insights, particularly John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. But it's only a glimpse. And as Ally Dunbar put in the ad, Ally Dunbar, for the life you don't yet know, here's John saying, there's a life we don't yet know. But he's looking forward to that day with anticipation when that life will be manifested. There's coming a day, Finn, when we will see what it really is. It doth not yet appear what we're going to be. There was an old German commentator, a man called Bangle. He greatly influenced John Wesley, and I think George Whitfield also was influenced by his writings. And he says that that little word, what, it does not yet appear what, what we shall be, suggests something unspeakable. And dear people, what we are going to be is something unspeakable. Right now, we're the children of God. But what we're going to be, what lies in the future, is something unspeakable. Something that cannot be fully described at this present time. Something that hasn't been fully manifested. But he's anticipating it being manifested one day. Uh, the Apostle John is looking forward to that wonderful day. I don't know how many gardeners there are among you, but I'm not much of a gardener. I keep it tidy and that's about it. But if you go to buy a rose, you'll buy an old root. It has no form nor comeliness. It's not a very nice shape. But you know, you could never believe that that rose would one day become a beautiful textured flower, perfume and all. You see, it does not yet appear what it's going to be. When you look at it there in a garden center, and you're wondering, should you buy it? It does not yet appear what it's going to be. Or take that little acorn. Could you ever believe when you look at it, the smallness of it, that one day it will be a great oak tree? You see, it does not yet appear what it shall be. Or look at that little eaglet, a scrawny little thing in its nest. Could you ever believe that one day it's going to be a beautiful golden eagle soaring in the skies? You see, it does not yet appear what we shall be. Or even look at that caterpillar. Could you believe that one day it's going to be a beautiful butterfly? See, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But John says this is the manifestation that I'm anticipating. God's going to manifest one day what we are really going to be. When Paul was writing to the Colossians, he said this, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. And what a, a moment that will be. What a period of blessing that will be when we appear in glory. You know, the, the Scottish paraphrases, we still sing some of them here in Ireland. I don't know whether they sing them in many other parts of the world, but one of the Scottish paraphrases goes like this. High is the rank we now possess, but higher we shall rise, though what we shall hereafter be is hid from mortal eyes. Friend, what we're going to be is hid from from mortal eyes. We, we haven't seen it, and it's not been fully revealed, but one day, God, by God's grace, we're going to see it and know what it's going to be. Fanny Crosby put it in one of her great hymns, great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our worship, when Jesus we see. Yes, John shows tremendous affection. The affection John shows, the confirmation that John makes, we are right now, dear people, the children of God. And the manifestation that John anticipates, it does not yet appear what we're going to be, but one day, by the grace of God, it will. And then the fourth thing I see in this text is the expectation that John holds. Notice what he says here, but we know, that we shall that he shall appear. We know that when he shall appear, we're going to be like him. Now John is fully confident that Jesus Christ is coming back again. John is fully confident that the Lord will return. There's no doubt in John's mind that Jesus Christ will come again. There's no doubt in the mind of the apostle, this aged apostle, that one day the Lord will return. And the expectation that John holds is the expectation 
of the return of our Savior. Dear believer tonight, the Savior that saved us, he will one day return again. He's coming back. We don't know when. Uh, it's wrong to speculate. I know that sometimes people can have their charts and their ideas and they can give you dates and so on. But the scripture says that no man, not even Christ himself, knoweth the moment when he will return. Thomas Adams was an old Puritan and he said something that was typically Puritan. He said, he that rose from the clods will, dis will, will we expect from the clouds. He that rose from the clods we expect from the, cl from the clouds. And John is anticipating the Lord's return. And dear Christian, if you have loved the Lord and you've followed and served him, we look forward to that time when he'll come for us, that time when he'll come again, that time when he burst the clouds and come in all his splendor and glory. And what a moment that will be. I quoted from Alexander McLarnon the other night, Dr. Alexander McLarnon, and uh, I have a quote here from him tonight again. He says, the primitive church thought more about the second coming of Jesus Christ than about death or about heaven. The earthly Christians were looking not for a cleft in the ground called a grave, but for a cleavage in the sky called glory. They were watching not for the undertaker, but for the upper taker. That's how the child of God should be living, because Jesus is coming back again. Francis Ridley Habergill, in one of her hymns, she says, Oh, the joy to see thee reigning, thee my own beloved Lord, every tongue thy name confessing, worship, honor, glory, blessing, brought to thee with glad accord, thee my master and my friend, vindicated and enthroned, Unto our remotest end, glorified, adored, and owned. And folks, that all lies before us. It's for us. It's coming. And one day it will really, really happen. There were two great uh, Scottish preachers, brothers uh, Horatius Bonner and Andrew Bonner. And, uh, and uh, it said of Horatius Bonner that every night as he was going to bed, he would pull the curtains aside and look up out into the darkness and say, perhaps tonight, Lord. And when he got up in the morning, he would pull the curtains aside and look into the, the dawn and the breaking of day. And he would say, perhaps today, Lord. He was living in expectation of the Lord's return. And so was John. The affection John shows, the confirmation John makes, the manifestation that John anticipates, the expectation he holds that Jesus is coming again. But you know, those things are wonderful, but the rest of the text is even more wonderful. And the fifth thing I notice here is this, the transformation that John expects. He says here, we shall be like him. Friend, we shall be like him. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall be like him. If you could see my notes tonight, I have written in capital letters in red ink under that title, one single word, incredible, incredible. Friend, to think that we are going to be like Jesus. We're struggling to be like him here. Oh, we struggle. We struggle to try to be like Christ. But one day we're going to be really like him. We shall be like him. What a wonderful thing lies ahead. It's any wonder, wonder that John is excited when he thinks what lies ahead. We're going to be like Christ. We have to wait till his return for this to happen. But we know that when he shall appear, that's his return, we shall be like him. We'll not be equal with him, but we're going to be like him. For we shall see him as he is. John Calvin uh, once said this, we will be like him in that we will, he will conform our lowly bodies to his glorious body. And of course, Paul wrote about that in Philippians chapter 3 and 21. He says, who shall change our vile or our mortal or, or our, our lowly body uh, that we, it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. What a change. 
We're going to be like Jesus. We're going to be like the Lamb of God. We're going to be like the one who purchased our redemption for us and paid the full price, and it was a high price. And we're going to be like him, and we're going to be with him forever and ever. It's going to be amazing when we reach that point where we're like Jesus. Again, if I could quote from Calvin, he says this, And now, indeed, God begins to restore his image in us, but in such small measure. He's trying to restore his image now in us in such small measure. But one day we will really, truly be like him. We're going to be like the Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. I don't know whether you've ever gone down to Armagh when the uh, apple trees are in blossom. If you go to some of those orchards in Armagh, you'll discover that there's beautiful blossoms. And you know, if you take one of those blossoms and look at it, it's perfect. But it's not the full thing. It's not the ultimate thing. The ultimate thing is a beautiful, lovely apple. But it's perfect at that stage of development. And here we are tonight, sitting in our homes, wherever we may be. And you know, one day we're going to be like Jesus, and we're trying to be like him now. And even the more, what, how much more we try, we're still not the full thing. We're still not the right article. But one day we will be. Look at that little baby that's born into the world and look at his knuckles. It has got wrinkles in its knuckles. It has got so many features, but it's not the full thing. The full thing is a full grown person. But Jesus is coming one day and when he comes, we're going to be like him, like him. Friend, this is incredible. It's amazing even to think that we could be like our blessed Lord and Savior who died for us at Calvary. And the psalmist in Psalm 17 and verse 15, he has a, a great word of exhortation or joy, perhaps I should say. He says, I shall be satisfied when I awake in his likeness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in his likeness. I don't know who the author of this hymn is, but it's a great hymn. We shall behold him whom unseen we love. We shall be with him whom we long to see. We shall be like him, fit for realms above, with him and like him for eternity. Change in a moment and like him forever. Well, we'll come to that in a moment or two. Friend, it's a wonderful thought to think that we're going to be, be like Christ. John Stott was a, an Anglican preacher and he's now with the Lord too, but he preached at Keswick in 2007, and in his last address at Keswick, he quoted from two interesting people. He quoted from a former Arab Muslim, now a pastor, a former Arab Muslim. And this is what the Arab Muslim said. If all Christians were Christians, that is Christ-like, there would be no more Islam today. And that's from a man who was Islamic, a man who was a Muslim. And he said this, if all Christians were Christians, that is Christ-like, there would be no more Islam today. Friend, that's a challenging statement. It's a great rebuke to us. Also, he quoted from a Hindu professor in India. And the Hindu professor said to one of his students one day, if you Christians lived like Jesus Christ, India would be at your feet tomorrow. If you Christians lived like Jesus Christ, India would be at your feet tomorrow. Friend, that's a challenge. But thank God one day we're going to be like him. We're going to be like the Savior. And that leads me on to my next point. We have already looked at the affection John shows, the confirmation John makes that we are right now the children of God. The manifestation John anticipates, you are going to see him, he's going to come. The expectation John holds, he shall appear. And the transformation John expects, we shall be like him. But notice the vision John sees. He says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to see him as he is. Friend, that's the vision that John sees. Not only is he 
convinced that we are going to be like him at the Lord's return. But one day we're going to see him as he is. Can you imagine that? We're going to see the Savior. 1 Timothy 6, 6, 16 says, Who alone has immortality dwelling in him, unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. You know, we'll never be able to see him until we're changed. Until we're like him, friend, we cannot stand seeing the full glory of our Lord. Until we are like the Savior, only then we can we have that full glory revealed to us. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. But listen, for we shall see him as he is. Isn't that going to be a marvelous day when we see our Savior? And this is the vision that John sees. We're going to see him, the one who loved us, the one who gave himself for us. And we're going to see him, but we can only see him when we become like him. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And then we shall see him as he is. You've probably heard me use this illustration before, one I've used quite a number of times, but some of you may remember a man called Dave Pope. He was a gospel singer and did a lot of missionary work as well. Dave Pope was a student at Aston University in Birmingham. He was studying uh, behavioral psychology. His lectures finished on a Friday at midday and he would make his way into the center of Birmingham to a department store there. It was called Rackman's and they had a special floor there with uh, musical instruments and sheet music and things like that. And since he was mu interested in music, he went there to see the latest things and he would go there week by week. He tells of one Friday going to that store in Birmingham and he stepped on the escalator to go up to the music floor. And as the escalator was going up, he could hear someone play a piano and they were playing gospel hymns, playing gospel hymns. And when he got to the floor, he looked over and the man who was playing the gospel hymns was a piano tuner. He was in tuning the pianos that were for sale on the music floor of that department store. And he went over to him and began to chat to him and discovered he was blind. And uh, he discovered he was a child of God. And their conversation was so good that they agreed to meet. Uh, and, uh, on another Friday for coffee and share a little bit of fellowship, and that they did. And when he met this piano tuner, the piano tuner said to him, you know, Dave, I'm looking forward to dying. And Dave Pope said to him, that's a very strange thing. Well, he said, I've never seen my wife, and I've never seen my children, because I'm blind. And the first person I'm going to see will be my Lord and Savior. And when they published uh, the Piano Tuner's uh, biography, they gave that book the title, One Day I'll See You. That Piano Tuner, of course, was Peter Jackson, who became very well known as an evangelist and as a musician. One day I'll see you. You know, folks, one day Peter but we have seen him already for his home in the glory. One day we will see him too, even though we've been born with our eyesight. We're going to see him. What a moment. What a, what a blessing. Oh, this is something to look forward to. This is why I gave my message, message tonight the title, The Prospect of a Saved Soul. We're going to see Jesus. We're going to be like him. We're going to be with him forever and ever and ever. What a marvelous thing that's going to be. You know, when I was preparing this message and I prepared it a long time ago, uh, I was intrigued by how many hymns have been written on this theme. And I'd just like to quote some of them to you before I finish. Here's one. Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. 
on the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Or another one by a hymn writer called Ray Palmer. Jesus, these eyes have never seen that radiant form of thine. The veil of sense hangs dark between thy blessed face and mine. When dark these mortal eyes shall seal, when death these mortal eyes shall seal, and still this throbbing heart, the rending veil shall be revealed, all glorious as thou art. Wonderful, precious uh, words. John Newton wrote this, Weak is the effort of my heart, and cold my warmest thought. But when I see thee as thou art, I'll praise thee as I ought. And Mary Skelton, and when my Jesus face to face I see, when at his lofty throne I bow my knee, then in his love, in all its breadth and length, its height, its depth, its everlasting strength, my soul shall sing. And Fanny Crosby, great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and greater rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our worship, when Jesus we see. And blessed assurance, Fanny Crosby, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. It's going to be a marvellous day when we see our blessed Saviour. Who could describe it? But it's going to be reality. The affection John shows, beloved, friend, let's be affectionate one to another if we love our Saviour. The confirmation John makes right now, this very moment, we are the sons of God. The manifestation that John anticipates, it doesn't yet appear what we shall be, but it will appear one day. And the expectation John holds, we know that when he shall appear, he's coming back. And the transformation that John expects, we're going to be like him, going to be like him. The vision John sees, we shall see him as he really is. Well, that's all I've got to say, and may God bless to your hearts this portion of Scripture. And I would encourage you to go home tonight and read this verse and, and read it and reread it and get it into your mind because it's a precious verse. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I pray that God has used these messages night by night. You know, it's not easy preaching from a desk or a kitchen table. It's much easier doing it from a pulpit, but I trust it has come across to you in these past nights in the way that God meant it to do. Thank you so much. God bless.